Hello, I'm Cameo George, executive producer of American Experience, PBS's flagship and longest running history series. Fast Forward Conversations with American Experience is our monthly virtual event series where we discuss this, the themes explored in our films with historians and experts. Today's Fast Forward focuses on the history of protest fashion. It is inspired by our film, Riveted, The History of Jeans, now available to stream in full on our website and on the PBS video app for a limited time. Riveted, The History of Jeans reveals the fascinating and surprising history of America's most iconic garment. From the Wild West to high fashion and hip hop, jeans are the canvas on which the history of America has been written. Today, our guests will explore how fashion has contributed to many of the most influential social movements in American history. From suffragette white to the denim reclamation of the civil rights movement all the way up to present times, fashion has been a powerful tool for organizers for decades. As always, this is meant to be an interactive conversation, so I invite you to write questions in the chat. We'll answer as many as possible during the discussion. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge our corporate sponsor, Liberty Mutual Insurance. I'd also like to acknowledge the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Robert David Lyon Gardner Foundation, the Documentary Investment Group, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, PBS, our home station, GBH, and of course, viewers like you. Now, it is my privilege to introduce our panel for today's conversation. Tanisha Ford is a professor of history at the Graduate Center at the City University of New York. She's the author of three books, including Liberated Threads, Black Women, Style, and the Global Politics of Soul. Ben Barry is the Dean of Fashion and Associate Professor of Equity and Inclusion at Parsons School of Design. Our moderator, Cassidy Zachary, is a fashion historian and co-creator and host of the podcast Dressed, The History of Fashion. Thank you again, and please enjoy the conversation. Thank you, Cameo. Welcome, Tanisha and Ben. I am so pleased to be here with you today, especially because both of you have worked so hard to expand fashion and fashion history narratives and paradigms. You've done it in incredibly important and profound ways. And this is something that no doubt is gonna punctuate our conversation today about protest fashion. So I'd love if we could kind of just start at the basics maybe about a conversation that defines protest fashion. What is it generally speaking? And Tanisha, maybe you can start us off. Hi, Cassidy. Hi, Ben. <laughs> Glad to be here with you both. Um, in my work, which centers on people of African descent, I use the language of protest fashion to describe what happens when the global fashion industry co-opts the dress of grassroots movements and packages it for public consumption. And so when I'm thinking about um, the actual garments that are worn by, by activists, I rarely use the language fashion because again, to me that, that uh, speaks to something that's rather commercial. So unless the people in my studies are um, drawing upon something that is already commercialized, then I use the language of dress or uniform, because to me that feels like it's in alignment with the spirit of their protest, because most of the groups I study, be it SNCC or various movement for Black Lives Matter organizations or LGBTQ organizations, um, they're, they tend to be anti-capitalist. So for me to use the language of fashion to describe what they're wearing to me seems to go against their politics in a certain kind of way. So that's um, a language that I like to be very clear about when I'm using it. What do I mean? What about you, Ben? How would you define protest fashion or protest dress? Well, first, I'm so excited to be here with both of you and for this conversation. Um, I think for me, when I think of protest fashion, I think of an intervention into dominant systems of oppression and domination. And that intervention is both very personal in the body. It's clothing on the body and the feeling that creates and for, for someone. And then there's also that feeling of bodies and clothing out in the world. And what kind of intervention does that create? 
protest fashion, because it's a revolt, because it's a challenge to these dominant systems, often comes with varying degrees of risk. And so recognizing folks that are using fashion for protest, using fashion for activism, are bringing risk on their bodies, on themselves, often by engaging in that. Um, I think in my work, I often try to um, take a different position on wording and thinking of fashion. And in many ways, I like to reclaim the word fashion, reclaim it away from a capitalist dominant fashion industry and in the multiple ways it's created and worn and embodied within the world. Um, and recognizing that fashion has existed since time immemorial by so many communities. And so what happens when we challenge how fashion has traditionally been used and reclaim it in a plural way? Um, but certainly within the field of fashion studies, within fashion history, there are clear distinctions as Tanisha uh, mentioned between fashion and dress and style. And so, thinking about the language is important. Absolutely. And there's so many important conversations happening today around just the very definition and the word fashion itself, right? As Tanisha, as you both just spoke to, um, it's a very loaded term in many ways um, and, 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 and it comes with a very long history. Um, and there's certainly different types of protest dress and protest fashion, but what does coordinated fashion among groups of individuals, the way they clothe their bodies in coordination with one another do for a protest or a social movement? Because this is something we see time and time again. Uh, ben, do you want to take that question? Sure, I can start. I think certainly a co coordinated a look amongst a group provides a sense of solidarity, community, and connection. Um, it certainly allows someone to feel that they're part of something much bigger than themselves. They're part of that interdependent whole that is protesting against something in particular. I think it also creates a significant visual impact Right? When, whether that protest is taking up claiming public space, that coordinated fashion immediately has an impact, whether that's in person, whether that's in imagery, but that creates power. Definitely, and I, I, um, I think of it as a statement of collective politics, right? So who we are and what we stand for and who we are also trying to recruit into our movement. So think about the Black Panther Party, for example, when we're, when they wear those black leather jackets, that's something that was a staple in the black cool, you know, style lexicon in the 1960s and 70s. And they were trying to organize those who they referred to as the lump and proletariat, right? So your street hustlers, your thugs, your gang members, your, your sex workers, we want to see the, that these people who are on the margins of the margins move into the center of this movement for black freedom, black economic justice, black um, housing equality and so on and so forth. So we want to wear a garment that speaks to the people we also want to bring into the movement. That speaks, into their, speaks to their style aesthetic. Um, also, to Ben's point about this being visually arresting, I think about the pink pussy hats of the Women's March they knew that drone technology would be used on that day. So wearing a, a brightly colored garment on the head, an accessory on the head would be captured by all those drones flying overhead. And so that's a, another kind of um, arresting visual that is responding to the technology of the day. Yeah, and something I love that about that too is that clothing speaks without having to say anything, right? It's one of these elements in our society that that is imbued with all these different meanings depending who you are and how you interpret it. Um, but does protest fashion need to be coordinated or can anything be protest dress, protest fashion? I, I would like to pose this question first to Ben because at, Ben, your work really explores the transgression of societal gender norms in a lot of ways through the clothed body and how the everyday act of getting dressed, and Tanisha, your work speaks to this too, but how that everyday act can in and of itself be a protest. Yeah, I think that for many folks, every time we open our closets in the morning and choose what to wear and wear particular outfits out into the world, that can be a form of protest and revolt. And I think that, that might seem strange, right? To many folks, it might seem that fashion, is that really a form of protest? Is what I wear really a form of protest against these systems? 
Um, I haven't thought about it in that way. And often, as Madison Moore you know, has said, that if we don't have to think about what we wear, what we put on our bodies, it often means that we have the privilege just to fit in. And that's not just about wearing clothes that conform to dominant expectations, whether that's around gender, et cetera, but that's also being able to find clothes that fit your body, that provide access for your body and express who you are in the world. And so in my work, looking at queer and trans folks, uh, folks who are disabled, who are fat identified, wearing clothes that challenge the way these folks have been pathologized, medicalized, stigmatized, what, by simply showing joy in the body, by, by bringing, wearing clothes that bring that joy, that emote that joy, whether that's bright colors that showcase the body, that every day can be a form of protest and is a form of protest. Of course, that's always accompanied by risk, right? There is risk in dressing in ways that dramatically challenge dominant norms, um, right from stares to harassment to violence. And so I think we always have to think about protest fashion in everyday life as carrying risk with it. But certainly picking clothes every day is a form of protest. I agree. Uh, one of the, the frameworks I used in some of my early work around this looked at this, what I saw as a cycle of pleasure, violence, and innovation. And as with any cycle, you could start at any point in that, you know, to, to say which, which thing came first. But in the African-American context, to, to Ben's point about risk, I mean, when, when people wore Afros, particularly after the FBI goes on this hunt for Angela Davis, and they, they know that, that she um, is wearing, she wears her hair in an Afro. Anybody who was wearing an Afro, male or female, after that moment could be stopped and often were stopped and harassed by, by law enforcement. So, you know, and that's just one example of the kind of violent response, both state sanctioned and vigilante that could come in response to wearing something that was considered transgressive or something that had been adopted by a movement as a symbol of radical politics. But there was also a pleasure or a joy in getting dressed and getting that Afro pick and picking your hair out just perfectly or throwing on that leather jacket or, you know, your bell bottom pants, whatever it was. Right. Um, there's a pleasure in that. And I really wanted to capture that in my work as well. And I think that out of that cycle, we get innovation. Right. This is how these things become what I would call fashion, whether that be part of a global fashion system or a local fashion ecosystem. Um, that's how how we get that innovation that pushes the culture ahead as it relates to sartorial styling, politics, etc. So. I think it's really important to think about how these elements are, are intertwined and how activists who, who aren't living in a vacuum, right? They're living and breathing and moving every day, right? Um, how they are part of those, those moments, right? From the everyday, small, feeling good about yourself moment to that, you know, sustained and protracted violent response oftentimes to their protests. Yeah, and you both, both have, have exhibited a wide range of, you know, kind of emotive um, and reaction reactions that people have to clothing, be it personally or the government at large, um, or, or like in violent ways is what you both just spoke to. Why do you think the clothed or unclothed body, which is also plays a factor, is such a powerful vehicle for political expression historically and today, but also response? Mm. Oh, Ben, I want to hear, what do you think about that? <laughs> that's like the unclothed <laughs> piece, right? That's the part that I, I want to think through too, like the, un, the unclothed body. <laughs> I think so often because the clothed body and the unclothed body have been we weaponized, right? They've been weaponized by governments. They've been weaponized in our history of like slavery and colonization, um, particularly in North America in terms of what folks could and could not wear clothes that I think of indigenous communities whose clothes, you know, traditional dress was forcibly removed, whose hair was cut um, to look more white and Western. And so in many ways, right, and that was a symbol, for example, of the success of the settler colonization project. And so in many ways, because clothing has been weaponized, 
because the naked body has been weaponized. I think of the histories of so many queer communities um, and the role of the body and showing the body. Um, that because of that, clothing is so powerful. It's connected to a history. It's been a tool for policing and for domination. Yeah, and there's, I mean, so many examples as you just spoke to historically and even today. Um, and it's it's so interesting too how fashion has become a, a tool of imperialism in some so many ways, but then how so many different communities and individuals resist that imperialism, right? Resist that through the clothed and unclothed body. Um, so there's so many important protest fashion and dress moments from throughout American history. And the civil rights era is no exception. And so now we're gonna watch a clip to learn more about that. A man dies when he refuses to stand up for justice. A man dies when he refuses to take a stand for that which is true. So we're gonna stand up right here the classic image of the civil rights movement is Martin Luther King Jr. And he and many of his closest partners wore suits and button-down shirts, sort of a Sunday best approach. We'll be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Being a man of African descent, a lot hinged on his self-representation. He needed to present himself to the world as a respectable person because there was already a notch against him for being a black man. The focus on the Sunday best has obscured the fact that at that time, there were these young college students who say, instead, we're gonna wear denim because we want to show that our political bonds are to the Black working poor and not to the Black bourgeois. These young people, once they left Howard University, Fisk University, Tougaloo College, to head south, say, we're going to wear this denim alongside the working class and sharecroppers who had been trying for decades to fight for their right to vote. They were rebels with a cause. For young Black protesters, it absolutely is risky uh, with what they're wearing because they already have the systemic pressure up against them presuming that they are of a lower class or status in society. And so wearing um, a certain style of dress that is aligned with the laboring class, that is absolutely bold. As the Southern movement spreads and garners national media attention, you now have white students who decide to go South to help with the organizing. So when those white students go back north, they go back wearing denim. So Tanisha, as you speak to in that clip, Sunday Best and the denim reclamation are two very different approaches to protest dress during the civil rights movement. Can you talk a little bit about the tensions between these different approaches? Um, how do two groups fighting for a very similar cause land on such different looks? Is this variance a good thing for movements? How does it um, help the cause? And in what different ways, I guess? So first I want to explain something that I briefly touched on in the documentary, Riveted. Um, I want to explain going south, because I say that a couple of times. and. Going south is as much a political strategy as it is a destination. So you have black students from the upper south um, going to the deeper south. You have uh, black students in the urban centers of the, of the deep south moving to rural spaces in the deep south. And this is part of a political strategy to bring in outsiders um, to cause an agitation within these rural communities oftentimes that were these strongholds of white supremacy that were trying to keep 
Black people from registering to vote, that we're enacting everyday violences against these folks um, in, in effort to maintain Jim Crow segregation. So when you have this influx of people, particularly young, idealistic people who have their own vision for a radical democracy, it means that there can be cultural chafing, or generational chafing, or even class tensions among them and the people who are already in these communities. So um, Sunday Best, I think it's important to note, is also a political strategy, okay? It's, this, it's the um, idea of what will happen if we're dressed in these clothes that are deemed respectable, our Sunday best, and we are photographed by photojournalists, by you know news broadcast cameras, being attacked by law enforcement when we are presenting ourselves as law-abiding citizens, yet they would still attack us with billy clubs, with fire hoses, with attack dogs. Um, that speaks to the inhumanity of... Jim Crow segregation, and it's a sickness for for our country, right? So I want to point that out that that is a that that is a political tactic. Um, but the tension comes is that with the fact that at this moment, the organizations like the National NAACP, the SCLC, we think about Martin Luther King and the and the ministers, they are also deeply invested in a, a bourgeois politics of respectability. And a lot of these young members of SNCC and CORE are deliberately deciding that we don't want to align ourselves with them. We want to align ourselves with the Southern sharecroppers whom we're helping to organize, whom we're organizing alongside. And so they adopt the denim overalls of these sharecroppers as a way to mark that political alliance. Now, there are all sorts of tensions and different thoughts about this, even among other rural black folks. We're like, why are you dressing in this way? Um, why are you, why do you look dirty? Like, why are you wearing these clothes? Why do you look so unkempt? Why is your hair undone? But there's, it's, it's a thing that I go into in a lot of detail in my book, Liberated Threads, and also in an article that I have about uh, SNCC and the politics of dress in the Journal of Southern History. But that just gives you a, an introduction to some of those politics and how, again, like you said, Cassidy, within the, this movement, there are these various feelings about class and race and gender and, and identity. And um, all of those things get enacted through the clothes. So that's why in that case, in the Southern Movement case, dress is really a powerful tool of analysis for me as a historian. Absolutely. And as you just spoke to, they're powerful in their own different ways, right? Um, and um, yeah, it's such a pro. And um, anyway, sorry. Um, so there are many ex iconic examples of protest fashion historically. Um, we have suffragist white, we have Sunday best, we have the <laughs> eclectic look of hippie counterculture. People are all probably familiar with these. Um, are there any lesser known instances of protest fashion people should know about? Ben, do you have any examples off the top of your head? Yeah, I'll think of an example that's contemporary um, in America. And I like to think of Rebirth Garments, which is an independent label that um, is collectively run and it's designed for specifically trans, non-binary, genderqueer folks who are also disabled um, and size inclusive. And this clothing is spandex, it is colorful, it is loud, it hugs the body, it claims the body. And very much what it does is it challenges the dominant ways that trans, fat, disabled bodies um, have been forced to dress, have been told to dress. And as Tanisha talked about, is really about this pleasure in the body. And when folks you know, wear a lot of these clothes and this rebirth garment is really a community, it creates a protest, um, both collectively um, when they're together, but also individually when folks wear this. And so this is certainly a label that is really about claiming bodies that have been stigmatized and marginalized. A couple that come to mind for me, one, um, the zoot suit. Um, I think that zoot suits are often marginalized from the conversation around protest dress because oftentimes we don't think about, um, we don't center um, Chica Nex movements for social justice in the mid 20th century. Um, 
we often don't think about black and brown solidarities and how zoot suit is also a garment that crosses you know, those kind of racial boundaries so that we can see that there was solidarity between young black folks and young Latinx folks. Um, also the way that, that um, non-binary and even women identified uh, Latinx folks wore zoot suits as well. So we have this gender component. So I think the zoot suit is a fascinating garment to study. Um, and it also helps us connect over time from the 1920s when we see a rise in anti-Black and, and anti-Mexican violence and also in the, through the 19, the post-World War II era as well. Um, I also think about mini skirts. Mini skirts were a huge factor in, in my research as I learned um, both in the South African context and also in the Tanzanian context mm -hmm. where in both cases they went against notions of of feminine propriety in the South African context is you know a Christian notion of propriety in the Tanzanian context it's a Muslim notion of, of, of propriety um, and so that garment is really important because a lot of the in the South African context a lot of young activists who are protest protesting against apartheid wore mini skirts and stiletto heels and they would use the stiletto heels as a weapon if necessary to defend themselves at marches and protests but it also makes me think too about trans women of today and how a mini skirt um, to, to Ben's point about this like everyday dress that we're wearing, you know, how, but how in the, in the trans community wearing a mini skirt could get you arrested because trans women are, especially trans women of color are always already criminalized as sex workers. It can get you beaten. And so to see trans women reclaim the mini skirt um, is also another way to think about that garment. Absolutely. And that leads me actually directly into my next question. You kind of answered it is turning to the present. If you have either of you have a favorite or, um, you know, an important example of effective fashion activism, um, protest dress in today's modern times. Yeah, I think I almost want to flip it from just wearing the clothes to making the clothes, because one of the things that has really is part of protest fashion is in particular we're seeing it in today is this coordinated effort to make clothing. Whether it was the pink hats that Tanisha mentioned, the Women's March, and how those patterns were shared online and people made them in their homes and then wore them. Um, so I think of some of the work I do where we bring together um, queer and trans and fat and disabled communities to make clothes together and we share patterns and we distribute them and folks make clothes for their bodies um, that challenge what's inaccessible and not available by sort of the dominant fashion industry and in ways that allow them to have access to their body minds and also aesthetically express their desired identities. So this sharing of patterns um, and collective making also is part of this protest fashion conversation and this movement and with technology, with the internet, with social media, it's being accelerated more and more. And I think simply looking at some social media platforms, we see, for example, in bad activism, how for so many um, bad identified folks, particularly um, at, the top, at the upper end of the bad spectrum, sharing patterns is a critical way to not just clothe the body, but clothe the body in ways that feel right and challenge the way society has narrated the fat body. Um, and so the making of the clothing is also a really important part of protest fashion. And with social media today, we're seeing that accelerated and amplified more and more. Kanisha, do you have another example you'd like to speak to or even commenting on how social media has influenced the impact of dress on protest? Um, you know, as a, a child of the hip hop generation, I have really been fascinated with the life of the hoodie and how the hoodie has been used to mobilize uh, people of this, I guess at this point, we're, we're spanning a couple of generations of the hip hop generation. Um, and it's something that I write about in detail in my book, Dressed in Dreams, to think about how this garment, again, a garment, as, as so many of the garments that are adopted by um, Black movements, uh, they come from Black working class and working poor communities. 
And the hoodie is a garment that was worn by, you know, day laborers, refrigeration workers, um, con constructors, con um, <laughs> constructors, is that a word? <laughs> um, but worn by construction workers, there it is. Um, and then, then it, it was also then adopted as a, a form of, of um, hip hop style, you know, and to see that garment be taken up in the, for, you know, for example, in the Million Hoodies March as a tool of organizing after the murder of Trayvon Martin. Um, for me, that history is one that's really important. And also to then think about like the new aesthetic that we've created for the hoodie um, that I think comes right out of the Ferguson protest where we're using hashtags and ampersands um, and writing, you know, just short, brief, you know, statements on these these um, plain hoodies is also like a, a powerful way that people are marking an aesthetic for the larger movement for Black Lives. And so, I'd love that we could talk a little bit more about what happens to the power of a particular protest fashion, or in the case of the hoodie, I think is a good example, when it is adopted by the larger public, is going mainstream good or bad for the power, um, the symbolic power of that item of clothing? It's a great question. Um, I mean, so much of the dominant fashion industry, the ideas that are inspired and taken up and sold back or ideas that have been co-opted and stolen um, for multiply marginalized communities. Um, and protest fashion is certainly part of that. That's really what feeds the industry. Um, is that good for the mo for movement? Often styles that communities invented, right, are taken up and there's no credit, there's no sharing of wealth for, and, uh, and the meaning can often be lost. Um, I think where there's power is when there's almost the opposite, when there's garments that are designed for particular groups of folks, particular bodies, um, and they're taken up by folks who those garments were not designed for. Those garments were not conceived of to be worn by these groups of people. And I think that particularly for a lot of folks that have challenged the violence of the gender binary, um, it's been taking clothing that was the designer may have never intentionally designed it for them, but they're wearing clothes and putting styles together to claim and honor their body. Um, and so I think that there's power when clothing that comes from sort of this dominant fashion industry is taken up by groups of people um, who weren't intended for it because that can challenge dominant meanings. I think that often the meaning is lost um, and the depth of the meaning can be lost um, among other many things when the industry takes up clothing that was comes from community for protest. Um, capitalism seeks to destroy social movements, period, point blank, right? So, I think one of the ways that seems rather innocuous that it does this is by having us all then get excited about wearing a thing that we see all of you know the, the folks on social media wearing you know in a you know a virtual protest or we see images from you know in person protests and we want to wear those garments and. Um, fashion helps us to see them as cool, right? So we want to wear them because they're cool. They're of the moment. They're within the zeitgeist. And, and so that seems rather innocuous, right? It seems like, oh, or, or in, in fact, if I buy, you know, my shirt with all the names connected by the ampersand on it at Forever 21, I am in fact participating in the movement, right? So that, that's a way that it, that, that the fashion industry and the larger capitalist system that fuels it breaks down these social movements. Um, and this is a stance that's probably a stronger stance that I had when I went into working on Liberated Threads when it was just a dissertation at the time, uh, because now having lived through the large scale movements that we've lived through for the past several years, you can see it in action. It's not just me, you know, thinking, looking back to the past with a certain kind of nostalgia, you see it in action and, and seeing it in action, I think helps to drive certain things home for me, at least as a scholar and thinker. I think one of the 
the, if there is an upside of this, one good thing is that is when I get to see other Black, Black queer, um, Black, um, otherwise marginalized designers get to tell fashion stories from their own perspectives. Um, and, and so I think that it's, it's not by chance that we see more Black designers having a chance to uh, launch lines and find an audience for their work and find financial backing for their work. But all those things to me are go hand in hand. And so it's hard to disentangle them when we think about what happens when protests where it goes mainstream. Thank you both so much. This has been such a, an interesting um, conversation. We're gonna turn to our audience questions now. They're coming in. Um, Shelly on YouTube is asking about jewelry piercing and tattoos. Um, I, I'm assuming, are those a form of protest dress, um, protest fashion? Do you have, I, either of you have any thoughts on that? Can you go ahead? Well, you know, when we were think, talking about the the dressed and undressed body, what I one of the things I was thinking about is exactly that tattoos and piercings, and I was also thinking about Mimi Mimi Plonge and her work where she takes traditions of body scarification from West Africa and she um, brings those elements of you know her mother's heritage into her own you know fashion uh, design today, and I, I do think it's interesting to watch you know, from the time when I was a young, young girl growing up to wear a tattoo, to have tattoos or to have multiple piercings was really transgressive. And now we're at the point where it's like, maybe you could have a face tattoo and also, you know, work in corporate America. I mean, you know, maybe we're not all the way there, but the point <laughs> is that um, I think that there, that we do have to, to, to spend more time. And I think there, there is definitely work out there that's devoted to thinking about um, the power of body piercings and tattoo. I know, I think at one point, uh, my colleague friend David Leonard was working on things like speaking with scholars who have tattoos and they were doing some visual work around like, what does it mean to be a scholar? Um, particularly a scholar who's from, you know, marginalized communities um, to, to be a scholar with tattoos and, and body piercings and such. So definitely fruitful ground for, for discussion. And I would add, I think when we talk about dress, we are talking, as Tanisha said, all forms of body adornment. So we're talking about hair, we're also talking about makeup um, and how these are worn and styled and the meaning that that conveys is also an active form of protest. So we're really thinking about the body, right? In, and how it's adorned in all of these ways. Yeah, and then that makes me think of Alok Vadmanin's uh, work too. Um, he, of course, have, uh, they of course have the degender fashion movement, um, but also speaking out about how hair, body hair, right, has been stigmatized in so many ways. And so, just to wear your natural body hair is an act of of protest and and rebellion and reclamation. Um, so, a question from Angevine on YouTube asks: As fast fashion continues to destroy our planet. Do you see any examples of protest dress or fashion that contests this practice? And can you suggest future directions? I always point people to the work of Christina Moon and Minha Tham when um, um, thinking about questions related to fast fashion, related to sustainability and um, uh, labor practices, et cetera, because I think that their work is, is brilliant in that way to take up those questions. In fact, it was Christina Moon. I had never even heard the language fast fashion until I heard Christina present work on, on the subject. Okay, and another question from Fulani from YouTube asks, would early drag be considered protest clothing? Would it still be considered a form of protest today since drag is more commercialized and accepted to some degree now? That's a great question. I think, I often think about where the spaces in which we wear clothing also leads meaning to the revolt or to the protest. And I think drag is definitely an example of protest fashion, certainly dramatically challenging ideas around the binary. Um, and I think it has been obviously taken up by sort of mainstream culture in particular ways. And I still think it's a form of protest, particularly as we see 
um, drag artists think about gender, articulate gender in ways that reveal the plurality of gender. So I think the ways in which they're contesting dominant meanings, the idea of gender being in a binary, simply by how they style themselves and the evolution of drag um, and the way this is playing out certainly becomes a protest in dramatically expanding the multiple ways we think about gender. Mm -hmm. And I'd add to that the, you know, I think is a, a sibling of of drag is ballroom culture, like the whole ballroom fashion. And um, particularly for my work, I think about what ballroom has offered hip hop. And I think there's a way that hip hop is still um, viewed as very hyper masculine and um, and heteronormative in many ways. And so to think about how so much of hip hop culture has drawn from ballroom culture uh, is important for me to think about as well. And I think that there is still that element of resistance um, in, in the ballroom scene, even as it too has become more mainstream or has found a more mainstream audience with Pose and Legendary and other shows of that nature. And this actually takes me to one question I didn't get to earlier, but I wanted to make sure I, I asked it, which was, um, there's been concerted efforts, especially recently in the last couple of years to really expand the history and narratives of fashion, um, to center those who've often been left on the margins or quite frankly erased. How we tell certain stories, Rivet is such an incredible example of how to retell a familiar story that expands the narrative. So I'd love if you could talk a little bit just about the way we teach and talk about fashion and protest, um, how that's changed and why it's important to keep not necessarily rewriting these narratives, um, but telling them in a way that makes them more expansive. Ben, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think being dean of a fashion school, I see very much a deep effort to expand the ways in which we teach fashion history, fashion theory, the ways our worldviews of fashion expand. And I think one of the central ways that that's happening right now is to immediately question and expand how we think about knowledge and who holds that knowledge, recognizing that knowledge is grounded in lived experience. One doesn't need a PhD, although they might have one. One doesn't need a peer reviewed publication, although they might have those two, right? To have knowledge about fashion history. And in fact, part of expanding the narratives is expanding who is invited into the classroom as faculty um, to teach these courses, the sources that are selected, the citations that are used, some that follow more conventional academic routes, but also recognizing that there's a multiplicity beyond that. And so part of the thinking that I do in my work as Dean is how can we hire faculty members within a university that recognizes a variety of ways of knowing as equivalent and celebrate sources on curriculum that include blogs, that include oral history, that include so many different ways of knowledge and knowing that knowledge might come from traditional academic pipelines, but given systemic barriers to higher education, it also very well might not. And so how do we expand that possibility of where knowledge comes from and who teaches knowledge and center that in the classroom. That's certainly one way I'm seeing changes to expand the ways in which we're telling stories about fashion history and where we really, we're expanding that narrative. Yeah, and, and here's the moment where I definitely have to shout out Kimberly Jenkins, who I think has done amazing things to make this, um, this form of knowledge production accessible to a public audience um, with her fashion and race database. And I think she also has like a, a fashion journal of such that she, she runs. Um, and Jonathan Michael Square with the uh, Fashioning the Self platform. Um, both of them are doing some amazing public facing work around this. And then I'm, my, please forgive me, charge it to my head and not my heart. I'm forgetting the names of the two individuals who run the, the nameplate project. Uh, ben, do you know who I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. um, because that project is another one that you know reclaims 
jewelry, nameplate jewelry, nameplate, especially necklaces, rings as an important accessory for um, Latinx folks, Black folks. And it's another, again, online platform where you have like these people who are trained as social sciences, scientists who are using um, their, their social media space to make that way of knowing that they've, you know, gleaned from their own lives, but also from the academy um, accessible for everyday people. And everyday people can contribute to the archive that they're amassing as well. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to go back to a couple more. We're um, nearing the end of our time together. We have a couple more questions from the audience. Alex on Facebook asks, we've seen a lot of celebrity activist fashion recently. AOC's tax the rich dress comes to mind. How does celebrity protest fashion fit into this larger picture? Is it good for a movement or are these types of, of um, interactions distracting? Yeah, a lot of people had a lot to say about AOC's tax the rich <laughs> dress worn at the Met Gala. I think those moments reveal the complexity of the fashion chain, right? I think so much as there's the opportunity to amplify, there's the opportunity to reach a larger audience and create space. We've seen that start to happen, but that's when the deeper questions of who's designing the garment, where does it come from? What's the story behind it? What's that individual sort of commitment to that cause beyond just wearing it in that moment, right? The complexities of the supply chain, the complexities of who that is all come into play. Um, and so I think it can be very, very powerful if it's done thoughtfully and by partnering often with independent designers who really share that commitment as central to their work. So I just wanted to say, I found it, I grabbed my phone and looked, documenting the nameplate. So if you go to Instagram, you can find that. I just wanted to make sure I got it right because I wanted to shout those folks out for the amazing work that they're doing over there at documenting the nameplate. Um, as for celebrities, yeah, you know, it's always a tough one. The celebrities are always a tough one. The, and, and I noticed this is, was the case in my first project and it's still the case now when I'm thinking about philanthropy and money. I mean, the celebrities have, they have platforms, they have resources and those sorts of things. But, you know, the conversation is when, when we have money and influence, the question of compromise is always on the table, right? And what does it mean for, you know, for them to be involved in the thing? And, um, you know, we love them when, when it seems like they're doing something right that is for the people and that feels like it stems from a grassroots place. We hate them when we feel like they are capitulating to capitalist interests. So, you know, it's <laughs> what I'll say is that it makes for an interesting study as a scholar because it's, it's just so fraught, it's such a fraught ground that this, you know, this particularly black celebrities or black queer celebrities, the, the space that they're navigating is it's an interesting one. Yeah, especially today in the age of social media, when, I mean, everything travel, travels instantly and in a second, and it's around the world to hundreds of millions of people, potentially. Um, Victoria from YouTube asks, how do changes in media coverage of protests affect the garments that activists use to signal their political affiliation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really great question. That is a really great question. Um, <clears throat> because we know, not only do we see like these more, you know, forms of infiltration as policing that we've seen, you know, across movements in terms of, you know, agents being planted within organizations. Um, of course that still happens. So we, we have to know that that still happens, but the ways that they have whole teams devoted to policing and studying everything that's happening on social media social media to understand the moves of various organizations. Um, it makes it scary and it makes it dangerous. And one way I'll respond to that is by saying, you know, with the activist networks that I have uh, been connected to, that there is this, um, this way that, that they educate people to don't be so eager to upload photos of protests to the internet because you don't know what 
law enforcement is tracking or how they're tracking certain people and tracking them across protests across the country, um, even global protests, right? So there's a way that, you know, activists are attuned to the forms of, of how, how even police law enforcement is using, you know, forms of new media to try to crack down on activists. And so I do think that this has an impact on not only how they are addressing themselves, but um, where they're organizing, how they're planning, how they're planning uh, protests and other actions. It's, 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 it's actually really scary for, for the people who um, are putting their bodies on the line in order to fight for justice for, for us all. Ben, do you have any thoughts on that before I move on to probably our last question? Let's go to the last question. Okay. Uh, so Maya from YouTube asks, who are some modern day designers that create protest fashion or dress? Um, and I would even extend that to say, um, you mentioned like Kimberly Jenkins and the Fashion Race Database. Are there any um, groups or organizations, designers that you want to um, direct people to, um, to continue this conversation? continue learning about this topic. Yeah, I mean, I think we've shared so many. I think what's really exciting right now and often, right, one of the upsides of sort of social media, if we're talking about this, is the number of scholars and historians that have taken knowledge and are making it accessible, um, like Kimberly and like the Fashion Race Database, folks who are sharing patterns and teaching us how to make our own clothing. Um, right, as a way to think of fashion systems outside of that dominant industry. Um, and independent labels that do have a claim, who juggle and struggle with the complexities of capitalism, but do have a claim in social movements, that do have a claim in identities, and are making clothes specifically as a form of protest. And by purchasing clothes from them, um, or learning to make clothes from them, it's also becoming part of a community. Um, of other folks in that, recognizing that sitting within a capitalist system and that in and of itself, as Tanisha said, is an oppressive system, but that those are certainly moments and ways that for folks to check out where this is happening today. Mm -hmm. Custom Collaborative, that's another organization that I want to shout out. They are doing amazing work. It's Black owned. Um, they design, they empower women to design. Because again, especially in, in, in African descended communities in the United States, knowing how to sew, that is its own way of knowing, right? It's its own epistemology, it's its own knowledge system. And, but it's one that many of us have lost, right? My mother could sew, she designed and sewed her own clothes. I do not know how to sew. And I think custom collaborative is keeping a lot of those traditions alive while also em empowering um, local Black women and, and other non-Black folks who are um, designing in those traditions and styling in those traditions. So I, I would be remiss if I did not shout out Custom Collaborative. Thank you. So I guess we have a couple minutes. We still have um, time for maybe one more quick question. Um, we'll go from Victoria from YouTube. She asks how changes in media of coverage of protests, oh, I think I already asked that, I apologize. Oh, what is the effect of dress uniform for people that are part of the movement versus the effect of the images that come out of it later? So the clothing you wear as part of the movement versus the power of your clothing, what it projects when people interpret it through the media. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a really great question too. And it makes me think of something that, you know, the three of us were discussing before, and it was a great point that you raised Cassidy about, how do how do people adopt these clothes? Does it happen organically? Does it you know where does it come from? And and I think the greatest example of this is the Ferguson movement, because you had you know young folks primarily in in Ferguson, Missouri, who took to the streets and what they were wearing. Like when they heard that Michael Brown was killed and his body was still laying out out in the street, they took to the streets in what they were wearing, and it wasn't a thought about why, you know, why, why are we wearing these clothes at first, right? It's just, we're out in these streets, we're fighting for justice. And then there's this great moment where um, poet and activist Tef Poe goes on Melissa Harris, Harris Perry show, such an important show, oh my goodness. Um, and he explains that this movement walks around differently, that we, we wear our hoodies and t-shirts and snapbacks and sneakers because we know respectability won't save us. Right. And so 
he articulates this message to say something about the politics of the Ferguson movement, but people who are seeing, and he's saying that because he knows that people who are seeing images at home might have thoughts or have you know racist stereotypes that they project onto these young folks for why they're wearing what they're wearing. But he's saying this is deliberate and it's intentional from here going forward, right? Because this is a part of our politics. We're not invested in the Sunday best. And he uses that MHP platform um, on MSNBC to express the politics behind their dress. In closing, Ben, do you have any thoughts on that? I think sort of just overall to build off, it's that the meaning can often be, right? The meaning that a movement will have when they wear something, the meaning behind it that the group has, that someone has in their body, when that's obviously taken up by media, that can be lost, that can be misinterpreted, that can be changed. And as a result, the real histories and stories and narratives and decision-making are no longer there. Um, and I think that's often the challenge where something purely becomes a very superficial level of that sort of the, the clothing that then is taken up in a particular way without that particular meaning or even worse if it's misinterpreted. So I think that's always the challenge of using fashion as a form of protest. The meaning behind the individual or the group can often be lost. And so I think we are seeing more protests fashion, particularly with social media, specifically telling the stories of why they're wearing what they're wearing, where that comes from, what that means, to ensure there's not that misrepresentation or try to limit that risk. But that's certainly part of that, and that's there whenever it's taken up. Well, thank you, Tanisha. Thank you, Ben, for joining us today. Here's Cameo George with closing remarks. Thank you for joining us today for this conversation exploring the history of protest fashion. Riveted, the history of jeans is now available to stream in full on our website, americanexperience.org and in the PBS video app. You can watch our past forward conversations anytime on our YouTube channel and on our website. If you liked what you saw today, make sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel. And please join us next week for a brand new conversation examining the historical and present day diversity problems in the US State Department. Thank you again for joining us.